At this point, Dead Space Remake is the most unoptimized, non-Unreal Engine influenced game we have ever analyzed, but this title is so key to the future of optimization research, in both official presentation and what we'll show in this GPU pipeline analysis. Smash that subscriber button before we show you how Frostbite has regressed visually and performance-wise since one of its best releases being Need for Speed 2015, how once again butchered rasterized graphics manufacture visual value in unoptimized ray trace graphic techniques, and conclude what really killed performance by measuring the timings of a single frame so that we can learn about what could have been done to prevent such shameful optimization. This is the 1080p frame we captured on the 12GB desktop 3060. The visual issues will be pointed out as we explain how it was processed on the GPU. These are the settings that were used for the capture. The pipeline starts off with compute shaders related to particle effects, but 80% of the processing is never referenced in the rest of the pipeline. Opaque, textureless meshes are rendered in a prepass where overly dense, quad overdraw inducing geometry destroys hardware depth rendering efficiency. Most of this portion pointlessly copies the depth to an identical buffer just so that a depth MIP chain that's never used is created. Though 80 microseconds of this timing is used to downsample the prepass for some kind of culling dispatch. A second prepass of alpha masked and textured depth required meshes are rendered on top of the current depth. LODs and topology was severely butchered in this title, but unlike better performing titles that may not have perfect prepass logic, they don't do everything wrong like Dead Space Remake. Even Jedi Survivor manages a two times faster prepass because of better geometry and not drawing slow textures in the prepass. Dead Space Remake's prepass also draws several textures instead of a single BC4 mask. Sometimes two BC4s are used alongside occasional BC7 textures. All of these pre-pass draws also include six specific textures as pixel shader inputs, which also goes for every single base pass and translucent draw going forward in the pipeline. Now, most likely, this has something to do with the base pass taking a horrendous 4 milliseconds to process. While a bloated pre-pass already alluded to this turn of events because PBR textures and outputs will multiply the result of any pre-pass, 21 high and low resolution additional textures are fed as inputs to each base pass draw, including the base pass draws that wrote extra skin information. To make things clear, this draw uses its mesh unique textures and those 21 extra textures. This happens for every single mesh draw in and beyond the base pass. Those 21 extra textures are absolutely impacting performance because this basic mesh with medium resolution fairly compressed textures has a completely butchered shading ratio. Geometric decals are written into the base pass outputs pretty fast, but the most expensive draw comes from this overly large vertex boundary, causing almost 2 million wasted pixel invocations. Before this, some wasteful depth stencil copy draws are initiated, but draw 1458 converts the normal and skin outputs into some oddly packed formats required as inputs to project those decals. Need for Speed 2015 only created the 8-bit input for decals. The final opaque depth is converted into a smaller format again to be processed by two large compute shaders that process data used in the fog, translucent shaders, and direct lighting stages. This small stage of events clears the half-resolution SSAO, creates half-resolution RG16 and R8 normal buffers from the base pass normals, and creates a same precision half-resolution depth buffer used in the half-resolution SSAO pass. Now, idiotic modern development culture would call Dead Space Remake's SSAO as the most optimized, because it has the fastest timing. But optimization is not about speed. It's about getting great results for a reasonable or great cost. But this chart has more purpose than just showing how incompetently unoptimized Unreal is, what needs to be discussed is that Dead Space Remake is the only game here that offers expensive, hardware-locked ray-traced ambient occlusion, and its rasterized screen space counterpart is one of the few SSAO versions that's shaded at a half resolution, which means one-fourth of the screen has SSAO evaluated in comparison with most of the other techniques. And Dead Space Remake is the only game here that doesn't feed the scene normals as an SSAO input which will drastically decrease the AO's visual quality, and it's a major reason why the in-game SSAO can't properly ground objects in comparison with RTAO. This compute shader analyzes the base pass RGBA8's roughness specular buffer later used in the lighting pass. Then, five separate quads overwrite some of the shadow map areas with cast shadow map data. 
than overly dense geometry is rendered inside shadow maps much higher resolution than the objects within the screen. The atlas is processed in a stream of small compute shaders, and at the end, a full screen stencil is rendered in the main depth stencil buffer for the next projection draw that projects a far field shadow map. Usually shadow map projections utilize the scene normals, but this pipeline only uses the depth, and one of the base paths RGBA 8's alpha channel. The stencil is cleared, and the second cascaded shadow map is rendered inside an 896 squared resolution shadow map. The stencil only writes a small amount of information, so only a small amount of the shadow map is projected. The small stencil portion is cleared again, and the last cascaded shadow map is rendered. As discussed previously on the channel, we can tell that the rendering distance resolution ratios are extremely unoptimized, and it's a big reason as to why characters on screen are lacking so much self-shadowing. Another stencil is made for the projection, and this time about half the scene is subjected to that projection cost. Then, the half resolution depth and RG16 normal are used alongside several 3D textures to shade a half resolution indirect lighting buffer. After being upscaled to native resolution using nearest filtering later on, the indirect GI is ready to be used in lighting stages. No smearing, no light map texture or base pass blow, and at least 2000% faster than your typical DDGI, Sfogi, or Lumen GI. Next, Stochastic SSR is processed. We've explained the importance of Stochastic SSR, but let's quickly refresh on how this was done in Need for Speed 2015. By default, the reflections were shaded on a half-resolution output, which made the result look horribly pixelated. But forcing the SSR to shade at native resolution provides a much more pleasing result without much cost, because shading SSR traces was already cheap to begin with. But a third modification using commands with seemingly no detectable cost forces the output to appear less horizontal. This is easier to visualize if we look at each pre-denoise tracing side by side. The rightmost result resembles some type of Bayer slash order dithering matrix, which helps simple denoising to appear more smooth. By default, Dead Space Remake shades SSR in the same exact way as fully modded Need for Speed 2015 SSR. If similar commands are used for Dead Space Remake, the SSR output becomes more vertically aligned. After we found these commands had no performance impact, we ended up choosing the command altered frame due to its more visually compelling final frame. But let's quickly discuss the default Dead Space Remake SSR in the secondary capture and compare the cost with fully modded Need for Speed 2015 output in a highly reflective area. At first it looks like a performance regression, and while Dead Space Remake reduces the compiler optimizations, the Dead Space Remake scene is more complex, increasing the amount of rays traced as seen in this classification buffer. The temporal denoisement only takes 100 microseconds, but we need to discuss why SSR looks so poor. It's sampling rays through a mathematically defined pattern, like you would see with Bayer slash order dithering. These mathematically derived patterns are not spatially consistent on a temporal basis, as we can see with the leftover noise in UE5's extremely poor interleaved gradient noise SSR. Self-temporally denoising effects need sampling based on random probability, but the probability has to guarantee a spatially even result temporally, which Blue Noise provides. Need for Speed 2015 results are only impressive for its time. Remember that this is a decade old game, and the results 8 years later almost feel like a regression because of how badly it handles complex normals and basic motion. Modern SSR should at least be as good as Detroit Become Humans SSR, which has almost no pixelated noise and almost perfect reprojection preventing ghosting inside the reflections. And the results on screen are done without TA as it's been forced off. And this is done without shading a full resolution SSR buffer because the developer specifically wanted to overcome Frostbite's visual issues and a big help in that goal was using noise-based sampling. Even at the lowest settings, updating the 3D volumetric fog textures takes a massive 1.3 milliseconds to update. This is based on Frostbite's decade-old paper, and while we do think this approach is considerably unoptimized, a discussion on volumetric fog would probably benefit from a dedicated video. Tile-deferred lighting is processed for most opaque objects, while hair and skin are forward-rendered. The depth and stencil channels are copied into a duplicate format for later draws, followed by the geometric re-renders of emissive objects. Now some pipelines, like we saw with Jedi Survivor, will output emissives to the lit buffer in the base pass to prevent all these extra pixel invocations and the cost of redundant texture addressing, which is a much better approach. Some translucents are pre-passed, followed by fog shading. The RGBA16 type list is copied to an RGBA16 float where translucents are rendered on top. 
non-visible translucent billboard effects are rendered on top of a blank resolution RGBA16 format, which is pasted on that full resolution lit float buffer, which is then mitmapped for the next batch of translucent draws. These have a massive cost not because they're forward rendered translucents, but because they also draw those 20 extra textures. Another redundant copy texture resource is processed for the depth and stencil channel, followed by more translucent effects. Draw 2695 takes the longest because it's a large overlapping billboard effect that's responsible for most of these pixel invocations, whereas the hair is responsible for most of that geometric density. A half resolution version of the depth stencil is processed again, for this time actually visible half resolution shaded effects. This may surprise some people, but the tiny effects are not the most expensive. The opacity of these effects are rendered again into another mask, and this is blended with a current lit frame. RG16 motion vectors are derived exclusively from the depth and camera movement. Then, skinned objects are rendered again on top to correct animated motion vectors. Like emissives, rendering geometry another time has a major cost that would barely exist if processed in the base pass. TAA is then processed. Anti-aliasing should not average out current frame detail, and this TAA creates a particularly unnatural image due to sharpening artifacts. While I don't think that morphological-only AA is a good modern solution, SMAA is far less blurry, and this comparison further enhances this channel's argument that bad anti-aliasing isn't even good at anti-aliasing slash edge smoothing. Using the depth, the motion vectors are altered for motion blur. While Threat Interactive aims for a very specific approach for this technique, a big problem with modern motion blur is that most implementations are based on this 2014 paper, which made genuine improvements to sampling, but is ruined by the second technique discussed in the paper. Now, Need for Speed 2015 doesn't use the 2014 motion blur technique. If you take a reasonable look at this, you won't recognize any particular pattern inside the motion blur streaks. To show what I mean, this is what the motion blur would look like if it was patterned. Again, original non-patterned result, then modified pattern result. Patterns look bad for two reasons, because our brains are trained to catch and recognize patterns, and because it goes against our objective standard of reality. Now if we look at Jedi Survivor's UE4 motion blur, which is based on the 2014 paper, we can easily pick up on the 2014 interleaved gradient noise pattern. This noisy patterned motion blur is used in many other engines like UE5, CryEngine, and Modern Frostbite, as we can see in this tertiary capture with TAA removed. Interleaved gradient noise introduces a hideous, highly perceptible sawtooth pattern. Should the new technique be thrown out? No. Interleaved gradient noise, which is not a texture but a small arithmetic function, needs to be replaced with an actual texture containing white noise like Need for Speed 2015. Even though this didn't affect the cost in the analysis tool, we can even reduce the texture size by half as this had no effect on the visual output. Because this capture takes place under a bridge during high speed movement, motion blur's cost is put under a lot more stress. Reducing the white texture noise to practically nothing provides an extra 12 microseconds. A white noise texture isn't just worth it, it's a no-brainer if genuinely optimized results are wanted. While we may go deeper into this topic for another video, white noise is purposely being recommended over blue noise, whereas spatial temporal blue noise is still up in the air. Blue mitmaps are processed and the RGBA16 is converted into an RG11B10, followed by massive copy texture regions, which copy video data to buffers larger than the game set resolution for patterns used in the menus. This is one of the worst issues with this pipeline. UI and other graphical elements are processed and then combined with the RG11B10 frame into an RGBA10A2 final frame. The final budget matches up pretty well with in-game performance, which is basically the computation of three different cleaner looking titles and almost a whole game away from 60 FPS. Now this analysis was supposed to go over the texture research released for this game, but the analysis ended up taking up much more time out of this video than expected but this analysis was still needed to understand the next main topics. Before you click out of the video, note that it requires a massive amount of labor to compile complex data and comparisons like this. We do so with unique critical thinking and use the same exact reasonable consumer level hardware in every single video, and it wouldn't be possible without our current Patreon members. As much as it may annoy you to hear it, we need to see revenue growth from these efforts, Community support through Patreon is the best way to keep our work sustainable and spread the required culture that will support 
real progression. Consider helping us by filling out this list with your name by the time we release our next video. Watch our content in order of release to understand the dire graphics industry optimization crisis and what solutions can lead to vastly better looking and better performing games. Until the next video.